Now, the text today that God has given and has planned this from the time I started this, he had me start this, was about God's kingdom power. And it started out in Matthew chapter number 8 with leper being healed and then the centurion. And then we move across the sea and there's this storm and it rages going wild as a demonic attack, very plain and very simple to see. And the disciples get a new revelation, what kind of man are you? Then he gets to the other side and there is one miracle, but it lays the groundwork for many more miracles to come when he casts the demons out of the the man, the legion of demons. When Jesus fed the 4,000, after he left the woman, the Syrophoenician woman. He fed the 4,000 in Decapolis, that area where that man was. They begged him to leave, but when he came back and he fed the 4,000, they were bringing hundreds of people to him, and thousands were coming to hear the message. Then we move on in the message and, until we get to the paralytic that's let down through the roof. But today, let me get to this part about today's message. It's about this synagogue ruler and a 12 year old daughter that is sick and about to die but why Jesus is going to touch her is family and then when Jesus is going there there's this woman that has an issue of blood and she hears about Jesus and then Jesus says this after she had touched him and he speaks about her faith he says daughter daughter only time that word daughter is mentioned in the book of Mark that we're reading, daughter. It's family. God's interested. He loves all of us as children, sons and daughters of God. If you are in this room and you're over 90, you're still a son or a daughter of God. Family. God, we're part of his family. Jesus cares about his family. He cares about me, and he cares about you, and he cares about your children. Jesus cares about my faith, the starting out of my faith, and he cares about my following through with my faith all the way to the end. That's in this story today also. Jesus is concerned about what you hear. He wants you to hear the good news. He wants you to hear messages of God's grace. He wants you to hear messages of God healing people. Let me just encourage you to go home and read John chapter number 14. And right after verse number 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says, Jesus says, y'all have seen the Father. And, Jesus, and Philip says, Lord, have we really? And Jesus says this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So whenever we see Jesus healing the leper, we're seeing God in action. When we see him getting up out of the boat and the storms are scaring everybody to death and him saying, peace, we're seeing God in action. When we see Jesus healing multitudes, hundreds and thousands, every sick case, every desperate case, little case, big case, and he heals them, we're seeing God in action. So all of this takes place, and at the end of chapter number 9, these words come from Jesus' lips to his disciples. The harvest is plentiful. If you read back and see what I've done, there's a lot to do, but the laborers are few, and he says, pray the Lord. And so in the very next chapter, he anoints 12 of his disciples to go out to do the very same thing that he has been doing. Jesus wants that to happen today. God in action. Jesus Christ in action. So let's look at some scriptures, and I know there's lots of text that I'm going to read. I hope you're not bored with it, but it builds a foundation to where we are going. And it tells you how Jesus wound up in Capernaum. He was raised in a little town called Nazareth. Little, small, insignificant town, more or less. But he goes to Jerusalem, and he's baptized in Jerusalem, down at, at, at the Jordan, close to Jerusalem. And then John's put in prison, and that's where we want to stay right here. That's where we want to start. Jesus has been down in Judea, too, preaching just like John has. Verse number 12. 
Slide number three. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee, leaving Nazareth, his hometown. He went and he lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. From that time, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So what is the kingdom of heaven? We find that what it is in verse 23 and 24 of the same chapter. And Jesus went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. God is love. Blessed are the poor in spirit. In the next few weeks, we're going to get, we're talking about kingdom power, but in the next few weeks, we're going to talk about kingdom living. And if we're going to have kingdom power in our life, we've got to have some kingdom living in our life. Yes. Many people wonder why they don't have kingdom powers because we don't do kingdom living. So there's a lot in the Sermon on the Mount. And preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. News about him, about Jesus spread all over Syria, and the people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering with pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Now look at the next verse. Large, everybody say large. Large crowds from Galilee. That's everybody around that sea. That's from where he is, from Nazareth, and all right around him. And Decapolis across the sea. Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan. They were flocking to Galilee to hear this teacher that was filled with God, who was God walking in the flesh. The story that I'm going to read to you today and to speak to you about, about the woman with the issue of blood and the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus by name, it's in Matthew, but the book of Mark gives us a little more detail. So it's there in the same thing as Mark, as Matthew is building. So let's look at verses 21 through verse 43. When Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, he just left where he cast the demons out. And he comes back to Capernaum. Large crowds gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him earnestly, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When, Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt it in her body, and she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. The woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, family. You like that? Family, daughter. First time he had met her, <laughs> she has come into the kingdom, daughter. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And while he was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, saying, Your daughter is dead. Family. Jesus is concerned about family members that are dead and are dying. How many of y'all in this room have got family members that's not saved? children, grandchildren, nieces, aunts, your neighbor. God wants to make them daughter. Your daughter is dead, 
they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with the people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all of this commotion? Why all the wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after he had put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and they went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up, walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. Everybody say astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. God's generosity is shown in the healing of the leper, but also of the Gentile, the person that's not a Jew, the person that the Jews didn't want to touch. His generosity is shown in that. The Son of God power is shown when he calms the sea. And then when the paralytic is let down there and he says, your sins are forgiven you, this miracle took place in Capernaum. There were scribes, Pharisees there from Jerusalem that had heard about things that Jesus had done and they had come to investigate. And this shows us that all authority, who has power to forgive sins but God alone and Jesus who is God, God is fully in Jesus Christ. So it shows us that he has all authority. And today we will see that Christ is saying, let your faith arise, let it arise. Everybody in this room has a little bit of faith in you. I don't care if you're not saved you got a little bit of faith inside of you Romans chapter 12 verse number 3 says let no man let no woman think any more highly of themselves than they ought to think but everybody should think with a sober mind for God has given to everybody a measure everybody say measure we've got something to work with we've got something to work with even if you're unsaved and you say that's not true you have to fight against the devil to say yes yeah you're right it's not true and the Holy Spirit is saying it is true and you can squash it down so much to pretty soon you believe that God's not real sort of but somewhere deep down inside at the right moment you'll come running to Jesus faith in today's story we see the authority of Jesus out front, up front, all over. But in this we see faith stressed. We see a woman that had an issue of blood. Her, the woman, and the little girl were on two economic ends of the ladder. The woman had spent everything that she had. Her husband, if she was ever married, probably left her by now. We don't know. But Jesus wants to touch everybody. He wants to touch everybody. And so we find this thing. Where does faith come from? It comes from a little seed that's placed in everybody from the day that we are born. But then there's something about faith. Hearing makes way for opportunity. I'm going to read two verses that I've already read at the beginning of this. But Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread. I'm not going to read the rest of that, but you read the list of the miracles that were there. How many of you believe? I know they didn't have Facebook then. They didn't have the Telegraph then. They didn't have Pony Express then. But from Syria to Decapolis, other side of the Jordan, all the way down to Jerusalem, the whole land at that time was covered with stories about Jesus about the power of Jesus to heal. The whole land was filled with stories. I can take a little corn seed, if it's garden seed planting time, and go to the store and buy a seed for planting. I can set it on the counter, and it's just there all by itself. But if I take that little seed and I plant it and water it, 
Watch over it, water it, it will grow. Most corn stalks will have two ears of corn on it. Now, and at one time, I took a full ear of corn and I counted every little corner kernel in that little thing. So one seed planted can give you quite possibly 200 other little kernels that you can plant. But that's not the story. The story is the seed. And so we see that Jesus wants everybody to respond to what God is doing in his life. And the Holy Spirit is sweeping through the land. And so everybody that's hearing this, hearing this, the Holy Spirit is trying to take that seed of a miracle in their heart and trying to get it to grow. Trying. Everybody say, trying. Jesus tried to get in my heart when I was 12, 13, 14, 15. I was so aggravated with Jesus trying to get into my heart and so frustrated with yielding my life to him that I said, when I get 16, I'm quitting school, getting the job, and I won't never go to church again in my life. I'll just wait to right before Jesus comes, and I'll slide in. It doesn't work that way. God wants the seed to grow. And when you have a need, the seed will grow. This woman that had the issue of blood, she had that and she had spent every dime that she had. And she just wanted to get better. And so when she hears this story, Holy Spirit is working her. Can I use that term and you're not offended? He's working her. Holy Spirit worked me and I run from him. But there come a time when the God spoke to me by the Holy Spirit and said, if you die tonight, you're going to hell. And that got my attention real good. And all of a sudden, those seeds that had been planted years ago in Sunday school, God began to nurture them. And I responded, seed. The woman heard something. I don't care what kind of pride you have in your life, but she heard. We're going to get back to her in just a moment, but as soon as Jesus landed, he does some teaching there by the Sea of Galilee when he gets out of the boat, and you can read through the ninth chapter of Matthew and hear some of the teaching that he did, but as he's there, word goes back to the shore where Jairus lives, and his daughter is pressing close to death. Now, the miracle took place of the paralytic being let down through the roof, and they're tearing it up in Capernaum where Jairus was a ruler of that synagogue. And he may have been one of the rulers there. And some of scribes and Pharisees had been up there. And they said, who can forgive? Forgive sins but God. They probably had a powwow. Y'all know what a powwow is? A powwow is fishermen sitting around the liar's table at a restaurant. A powwow is a bunch of ladies getting together and having a hen party. Powwow is Indians in the Old Testament sitting around smoking a peace pipe with lion colonels and Indians. But, but, Holy Spirit was having a powwow in this woman's heart and in her life, saying, See, God's working a purpose. Jesus Christ wants to work a purpose in our life. He is pure in his purpose. He has no agenda except saving us. For God so loved the world, he is pure in his purpose, and he's having a powwow. And Jairus, whenever they left the synagogue that day with the scribes and the Pharisees, they probably had a powwow. What are we going to do with this man? And they're building like a coalition against him. And it's a fearful thing to stand up against them. We read once in John 9 when Jesus opened the eyes of a blind man and they're asking the blind man how he got his eyesight again. And they're inquiring to the blind man's mother and daddy. How did this happen? And they said, ask him, he is of age. Because word had spread that if any man says that Jesus is the Messiah, we're kicking them out of the church. And so they see how powwows happen. And so they had a powwow, but something had happened in Jairus' house. His daughter became sick, and she is near 
death. She is really near death because she dies before he gets there. But the, he has heard about Jesus. He had seen Jesus possibly. He was in the synagogue that day when he says, your sins are forgiven you. And then he probably saw him when he raised him up and sent him out if he was at church that day. But he had definitely heard about those miracles. So we see about seed planting. Has God ever planted some seed in your heart? What are you waiting for God to do in your life? And then God may be asking you, I'm waiting on you to respond to some things I've touched you in your life for you to do. God is not like Aladdin's lamp and in our moment that we really need him and rub him and he shows up. He wants us to serve him 24-7. Jesus is looking for people that has a meek spirit, a kind spirit, yet firm, meek and kind. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require out of anybody who is a believer. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk. Everybody say that word louder. In a moment, just right, walk humbly with your God. And in just a moment, Try to do a self-definition of what humbly with God means. Every time Jesus presented, shared the gospel, he did so in a humble and meek spirit. Can you all think of one time when Christ never shared the message in a humble and meek spirit? Even in Matthew chapter 23 where he was rebuking scribes and Pharisees because they were like whited sepulchers. He did it with a humble and a meek spirit. That may be why God can't work through people because like we want him to work through us is because there is no humbleness. Come unto me everybody that labors heavy laden, got so much on your plate you just don't know what to do with it. Come unto me and learn about me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, King James Version, and you shall find rest for your souls. He wants our problems, family. He wants our problems, family. He wants my problems. He wants your problems. All this comes because seed. Jarius had heard and seen, and so a seed is planted into his heart. And so he comes to Jesus, and I don't care what kind of pride he had. When Jesus stepped on that shore and he heard, he run down there and he fell on his knees. And he says, Lord, my little daughter lies at home near death. Would you come? Do y'all think he was had earnestness in his voice? Yes, he, he, it was, he, there was no pride in his heart. It was like what, nothing in his heart there about you, who gives you this authority. What is in his heart then was all that authority I seen in the synagogue, I want you to come to the house with all of that authority because my daughter, if you touch her, we read it, if you touch her, She'll get well. Faith, seed. What kind of seed has God put in your heart? What are we doing to grow that? What are we doing? The Bible gives us some answers of how we can grow faith. To keep Joshua in the straight and narrow. Everybody say straight and narrow. Say it again, straight and narrow. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth but you shall meditate everybody say meditate now the word for meditate then uh, have any of y'all ever said something negative negative about anybody and you didn't want but just one or two people to hear look over at your neighbor and go they're a dog and I can't like them say it say, say it in a real soft voice I know you don't mean it you don't mean it but just say it Pastor Dan's a smart aleck. 
Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do everything that is written therein, for then you shall make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. The word meditate means mumble these words that's in my law softly to yourself. Get verses and memorize them and speak them over and over and over again. That's a good way to get faith to grow. Another good way is found in Psalms chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Blessed is the man and the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but their delight, their joy. Everybody say joy. Their delight is in the Word of God, and in His Word does He meditate, speaks it softly, day and night. Does he meditate in his law? And they that meditate in his law shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth their fruit in their season. So when we meditate in his word, that is why in Ephesians Paul says this, and I can't quote that as good as I could that, but it says this, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we speak psalms and words of scripture and so they're going <laughs> the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. I don't know how many miracles that she heard. Leprosy, paralyzed people, people having seizures, demon possessed, Holy Spirit's running those through her like a spring. Jarius, his daughter is sick, and he is saying, I know I may have been on their team for a while, but he said, this is my daughter, and everything that I've seen and heard about this Jesus is nothing but good and pure, and so it's running through his soul. And when his daughter is near death, I don't care what's going in his life, he's going for truth. Everybody say truth. He's not chasing a lie, he's chasing truth. So he runs, and Jesus says, I'll come. So immediately he starts out to go. And on the way there, the woman with the issue of blood comes up in behind him, and she touches him. She doesn't care. She doesn't care who is around she doesn't care if she gets Jesus' attention. She doesn't say, I want to be anointed when prayed for. She just goes up and touches him. She says, and, why does, and, and, and Jesus told the leper, don't go tell anybody, but why is Jesus drawing her out? Jesus is drawing her out because he wants everybody to see her faith. Everybody say faith. He's drawing her out. Who touched me? And she said within her, when she touched him, she felt, felt, felt in her body. I believe the guy that got let down through the roof when Jesus said, he didn't say get up and walk to start with. And when Jesus says your sins are forgiven you, I believe he felt like, whoo, something happened. Something happened to me. When Jesus says you are healed or you are made well that word in the Greek healed or made well is only spoken about being translated heal or well about nine times but about 60 times it is translated saved so she got saved that day same word he's drawing it out of her Jesus Christ wants to draw out of us our testimony how many here are walking around with closed lips about what Jesus has done in our life? He's trying to draw it out of us. You are the light of the world. He's trying to draw out of us. So he stops everything because he's going to draw the story out of her. Paul's story about the road to Damascus is in the book of Acts three times. If it's in the book of Acts three times, he's probably told that story more times than he, I've got fingers and toes. 
There's only one account in the book of Acts of Paul getting stripes on his back. But when he wrote 2 Corinthians, he said, I got that happened to me five times. So the book of Acts doesn't tell us everything, but it tells us enough God has tried to draw. And so he stops everything. And the woman come and who touched me? <laughs> that woman could have just kept running through the crowd. But she says in her spirit, I believe, I owe him. I owe him. I owe him the story. Not knowing when he when she owed him the story, that the story is going to be written for millions. There's over eight billion people on this earth today alive. And so from the time of Jesus to now, billions, that's not stretching it. That's not a spiritual term that's way out of the ballpark. Billions of people have read the story and have been touched with the story. But he's drawing the story out of her. He wants the story told. Daughter, your faith has saved you, healed you, made you well. Choose your translation. But God had made her whole. Jarius has probably got ants in his pants. Now use that term. Idgety, fidgety. But at the same time where all this is going on, hear me out before you correct me. He's like, yeah, yeah. Jesus is going to my house. Yeah, his faith is exploding. But while his faith is exploding, somebody comes from his house and says, don't bother him anymore. Your daughter is dead. We can go from a high to a low that quick. Jesus, who is very sensitive, everybody say that, Jesus, who is very sensitive, immediately sees what the devil's trying to do with this man's faith and with his life and with what he is wanting him to do. It says, Jesus quickly says, fear not, just believe. Quickly, just like that. People at times, you hear the doctor say something bad about you, and you hear people saying something, and the doctor says, and Jesus will quickly speak a word into your life, and he's wanting to, everybody say, preserve. He's wanting to preserve what faith you had. The Bible doesn't tell us that Jairus responded back to Jesus in any kind of fashion. Just believe. Only believe. Just keep believing. I don't know what the devil spoke to him on the way to the house, but it seems like Jesus left everybody there because he took with him Peter, James, and John, and they went to the house. When they got to the house, we read that there's a lot of commotion going on, people wailing crying popular man ruler of the synagogue he probably got some people to come in well just because they were friends and he's a man of standing and they're wailing and Jesus comes and he says this stop your wailing she is not dead just asleep some of you would say Jesus lied but he didn't lie the soul that sins shall lie there may be a reason that this girl is 12 years old and, and maybe the account of accountability, but her soul was still in the presence of God. And when Jesus stood over her and says, Talithia of Kuma, she come back to life. Her spirit come back into her body. She's just sleeping. God knows what he is doing. Jesus Christ knows what he is doing. He is worthy. Y'all remember singing that song just a little earlier? He is worthy. Do you remember the tongues and the, the interpretation of tongues? Have you ever heard an interpretation said, family, my family's like that? 
I'll be with you. I'll help. But here we see family, my family. And here we see the story today, daughter to the woman with the issue of blood. And then we see this man, Jarius, and his daughter. God's concerned about family. He's concerned about me, and he's concerned about you. He's concerned about us following him. Our faith is so precious. Slide number 20. We went from slide 16 to 20 or slide 14. Look at that, man. Isn't that good? Slide 20, Mark 5, 35 and 36. I hit on this a while ago. I just want to touch on it again. Your daughter is dead. Can you imagine can you imagine the impact that had upon his life and upon him? My faith is precious. Peter tells us in his writings, your faith is more precious than gold. 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 More precious than gold. He raises her. Keep believing. Speak. Speak faith. Don't doubt. Ignoring what they said. Natasha, would you come? Slide 21. We started out with this. This is the opening verse. Family, daughter, poor. May not have been poor to start, but she's poor now. Spent everything, and there was no hope. I'm sure that whenever the daughter got sick, Jarius went and got the best doctors in Capernaum, and she kept getting worse. She's going to die. He, he sensed it. He knew it. Whatever pride I got in my life, I got to get rid of it for my daughter's sake. There's some healing that God wants to do in some people's lives, anger issues, unforgiveness issues, physical issues, healing in body. That God is, can I use a term, itching to do, wanting to do. Desiring to do, but he just can't do it until we confess it, give it to him, get anointed with oil, pray something God's waiting for a response. If Jarius had not went to Jesus, his daughter really would have died, and they would have had a funeral. They buried their children. They buried, Jews still buried their dead on the same day, just like Muslims do. They'd had a funeral that day by dark. May God arise today in this service. May God arise with what he's trying to do in your heart and in your life. May God arise with what he's trying to do in your family. Let God arise. Let God arise. Let his word arise. Let, he wants, let him, what he wants to do in your heart take place. Family, you are God's sons and daughters and he cares about you he cares about me I am so glad he cares about 